And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to FEDA 1811. Today, we're going to talk about the railroad killer, man. Got a lot to cover. Let's get right into it, gentlemen. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what FEDA covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. See him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of two murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes, aka Pushaisi violated. In order to stay away from the victim, Rapper Pushaisi arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured one this person. Is the, this is the one that that's gonna fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. Yeah. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm gonna invoke my fifth amendment right, right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect two set down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, their brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, we're back. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. Uh, today, we're going to be covering the railroad killer. But real quick, uh, number one, guys, check us out on rumble.com slash fresh and fit. As you guys know, we made them switch over to rumble. Don't worry. We're still going to be on YouTube. However, the after hour shows in the middle, we're going to be going over to rumble. But all the regular shows that we do Monday through Friday are going to go ahead and still be on fresh and fit on YouTube. OK, also uh, check us out on fresh and fit .com, um, where you guys can get all the behind the scenes action. And um, also, if you guys like this podcast and you guys like to listen to on audio, check it out on um, anchor.fm slash FEDA1811. Again, that's anchor.fm slash FEDA1811. I got Christina in the house with me. She's helping me out with the show. She just got off the plane. It's 325 in the morning right now. We're filming this for y'all. So she looks like crap, uh, but she's here. Wow. You, know you have anything you want to tell the people? Damn. <laughs> been boasting me all day. <laughs> you have anything um, you want to tell the people? Yeah. Contact me at FEDA1811 if you guys have on any Instagram. cases. Yeah, if you guys have any cases that we want to do and in whatever state you are in, just let me know because we do need people in different states to find cases for me. Yep. We're going to be, uh, you know, now that we finished the 9-11 stuff, we're going to go ahead and be hitting some of these serial killers for y'all. You guys have been requesting them like crazy. Christina actually has a list of people that you guys want us to cover. It takes time. Um, Zodiac Killer, Black yeah. Dahlia. What else people have been requesting? Um, been... Zodiac, Black Dahlia, Charles Manson, and then for, for serial killers and then we have like um we have the recent school shootings which i don't know oh yeah have, yeah yeah, yeah. you guys ones. been asking for those too and then we have like uh young Dolph. uh christina's yeah. gonna go to memphis for that one guys i'm gonna send her and xena to memphis they're gonna go ahead and take care of that so um Yay. they will go ahead and yeah because <laughs> people are too scared like bro every time we said and the fourth the, another suspect i think the fourth guy just got arrested recently so but anytime we send anyone over there, guys, they're like, oh, who are you? What's your name? Blah, blah, blah. They ask all these goddamn questions. So um, Christina and Dina, shout out to both of them. I'm going to have them go to Memphis and do it for me. They're going to go do a quick little trip. Go over there. Give me the documents. Come on back. We don't so, know when, though. We have to, yeah, like, we don't know when. Out. So Yeah. Um, we have to, like, we don't, the schedule's kind of busy right now. So. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, so today's episode, guys, we're going to be covering the railroad killer. So. Christina actually thought, so I did. I filmed the Night Stalker earlier, as you guys know. Make sure to like that video, by the way, and subscribe because YouTube made me made me take it down because they're lames. But it's back up uh, in its entirety. Uh, but she thought I was actually going to cover this one because me and her had been researching this case. What, like uh, two months ago, prior or something like this? We've we seen this before one? they even requested it. Yeah, we had. Yeah, we had been watched this one for a while. Yeah. So um, we're gonna go ahead and cover. It. Christina's actually excited to do this one. Uh, Am I <laughs> really? Uh, I got confused with the other one. Yeah, but you're like, oh, the, this one. I remember watching this one. Yeah, so, but they had the same thing. Yeah, anyway. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah, what, just because they're both Mexican? That's racist. Uh, no, because <laughs> they Bolivians both are racist. 
Wow. <laughs> All right, cool. You're so, the most basic person here. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, all right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and get it. So as you guys know, this name of this episode is called Tracks of a Killer uh, from the FBI Files. The, you know, the good old FBI Files, one of my favorite documentaries um, that we use on this on this podcast. So, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's get into it. Before I do, Christina, you got anything for the people before? Um, that was it, right? No, that's actually, that's, that's pretty much it. If you want any cases done, just contact us and just understand that it takes time. Yeah, yeah. It takes a lot of time. You like, you and a hundred other plus people have been, are requesting yeah. cases, man. And then also, I had to find a case. I had to find the name, the case number, the documents, and then we had to study it and see if it's like even worth it. It's just, it takes a lot. It takes hours. And Yeah, she does a lot of the research on the side. So, cool. Anyway, without further ado, guys, let's get right into it. The nation's railroads become the conduit of a killer. He strikes at random, then disappears. Recurring clues tell police they face the worst predator of all, a ritual serial killer. He's cunning, deadly, and on the move. But the authorities are determined to stop him in his tracks. Like that old 90s type shit. Like that unsolved mystery vibe, you know what I'm saying? All right. More than 200,000 miles of train track crossed the United States. From California to Kentucky, few living near a railroad felt safe in the summer of 1999. A serial killer rode the rails, picking towns and victims at random. He left behind a trail of bloodshed, but no trace of where he would turn up next. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the number of victims grew, the FBI enlisted the help of a profiler to help predict the killer's next move. On December 17th, 1998, in West University Place, Texas, a young woman called the police from outside the house of a friend she worked with. She was worried about her. She told them that her friend, a prominent doctor at a nearby medical school, had failed to show up at work that morning. According to her colleague, this was completely out of character. She had not responded to phone calls to the house all day, nor had she answered her door. When we hung up, everything was fine. She said she'd see me tomorrow. And nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing out of the ordinary. And that, that was yesterday. The colleague was sure that something was wrong. It's just, it's just not like her to do this. I'm, I'm just very concerned about it. The doors and windows of the house were locked. Look. From the outside, everything seemed normal. The officers found that the garage door was unlocked. And inside, the door to the house, wide open. Jewelry on the floor suggested a robbery. So obviously, right? police are on alert with something like that so they got to go ahead and they got to clear the house right they got to make sure hey let's make sure there's no one else in here what's going on obviously you got a prominent doctor in an affluent neighborhood missing not showing up for work and or returning phone calls and then they go and they see jewelry uh you know on the floor etc so they got to clear this goddamn place The house had been ransacked. The officers moved cautiously. An intruder could still be inside. The 
the downstairs was clear. But a trail of clothes led to the second floor. In the master bedroom, they found the doctor. He had been brutally murdered. 222, let me have a supervisor in a crime scene unit to the scene. So now they got a court in place off and call homicide detectives. So now this thing has been elevated, right? And especially for a small little area like this, a suburb of Houston, this is, uh, you know, unfamiliar territory for a lot of these detectives, man. Rare, very rarely do they end up with murders like this. Detective Kenneth Maha responded to the scene. Though a 10-year veteran of the department, he was surprised by the report of a homicide. West University Place, just a small little suburb, 2.2 square miles, right in the middle of Houston, largely residential and uh, an affluent community. And the last time we had a murder was in 1985 during a robbery. God damn. So well over a decade, guys, since they'd had a murder of a pharmacy the brutality of the crime struck the detective blood spatter was all over the place in the hallway and on the the walls and the door and just so y'all know i want to give you guys a quick little like insight as to this place okay uh west university place texas um often called west university or west U for short is a city located uh, in the U.S. state of Texas within the Houston Sugar Land metropolitan area and southwestern Harris County. At, at the 2000, uh, 2020 U.S. Census, the population of the city was about 15,000. It is nicknamed the neighborhood city and is mainly a bedroom community of upper for upper class uh, families. West University, West University Place, sorry guys, it's 3, 3.30 in the morning. It's surrounded by the cities of Bel Air, Houston, and Southside Place. As of 2011, West University Place has the state's fifth Highest concentration of households with incomes of $150,000 or greater, which is a very high income, guys, especially for the state of Texas. Um, so, yeah, the state's fifth highest concentration of wealth uh, in the state of Texas right there. So this ain't no broke boy place, man. All right. Uh, the body was completely covered except for uh, one arm sticking out and, uh, and her two legs. There was a large butcher knife that was near the body, laying on a pillow. Investigators also recovered a heavy, blood-spattered, blunt object nearby. Both were weapons of opportunity the killer found in the house. Mm, so that right there, guys. Big red flag, okay? Weapons of opportunity versus coming in with, you know, predetermined weapons. Police contacted the doctor's husband and learned he had taken the couple's two children out of town to visit relatives before Christmas. They'd been gone for several days. The victim had work obligations to take care of that wave, so she was not able to travel with him. Take a look at this over here. Evidence suggested that the killer had taken his time in the house. He tore open Christmas gifts and rummaged through the victim's belongings. Yeah, this is one of the most vile. What? You know, just going through all your stuff. That's what the fuck? so invasive, man. Going, opening up Christmas gifts, taking a kid's presents and shit. Like, what the fuck, bro? Contents of her purse were spilled out, and her driver's license was clearly left out and displayed. It was uh, it was quite strange to see it like that. Also, keep it noted that guys, driver's licenses being out left, uh, being left out in the open. In the kitchen, the detective found partially eaten fruit. Possibly more evidence the killer had lingered in the house. So he's going in there, 
open up Christmas presents, leaving licenses out, eating the food partially. Like, bruh. Stop it. Get some help. He also found the keys to the victim's Jeep. According to the doctor's husband, it was the only set. In the garage, there were no foreign fingerprints at the suspected point of entry. But on a workbench, investigators found the broken cover of a steering column next to some pry tools. The killer must have stolen the victim's Jeep. We surmise then that he had to uh, break the steering column of the Jeep uh, to actually crank it up and to start it. Here, the murderer made a crucial mistake. When I picked up the large piece of the steering column, I could visibly see fingerprints on the shiny black plastic. Oh, shit. They fucking got prints already. First crime scene. You stupid. The column cover was bagged for later analysis at the lab. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined cause of death. Multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma to the head. The victim had been sexually assaulted. The gruesome nature of the murder worried Detective Maha. It just didn't fit the pattern of a, a random killing. It was a step beyond. Investigators knew that killers like this usually don't strike only once. Two days later and 200 miles away, San Antonio police found an abandoned Jeep in a motel parking lot. All right, so San Antonio, guys, a lot further away. And, well, I don't want to give it away. We'll, we'll keep going. The plates were traced to West University Place. It belonged to the doctor. The plastic cover of the steering column was missing. Inside, investigators found a guitar and a meat cleaver. The doctor's husband had noted. Um, and just so y'all know, you guys are probably wondering, what's the drive like? Uh, it's about 197 miles, 200 miles, like they said before. Two hours and 56 minutes. It's about a three-hour drive from Houston to San Antonio. And Houston, guys, you know, is East Texas, and San Antonio is like the center. And I'm very familiar with San Antonio because I used to go here all the time uh, when I was an agent because a lot of the crooks that I used to chase from Laredo, right, all the way to San Antonio, because you guys see right here, here's Laredo, Texas right here. And then you got San Antonio on Interstate 35 over here. It's about a two and a half hour drive. So um, 144 miles to be exact. And then Houston to San Antonio is another uh, two or three hours about. Texas is a huge state, guys. That both items were missing from the house. Someone had hotwired the Jeep in a hurry. We noticed, too, that the uh, steering column was just an absolute uh, disarray. The Jeep was fingerprinted inside and out, but technicians found no usable prints. At the police department's forensics lab, analysts made electronic copies of the fingerprints lifted from the Jeep's steering column cover and ran them through an automated matching system. And at that time, we got a positive match. Now, before they announce the match, guys, this is obviously the late 90s now at this point. They have computers. They're able to, you know, put um, fingerprints and <clears throat> a bunch of other uh, against a bunch of other fingerprints and figure out who's who through IAFIS, which I explained on the Nice Dark episode, the automated uh, fingerprint identification system, AAFIS, um, which, you know, even when I was an agent, you use it. And it basically has. Everyone who's been fingerprinted, whether it's through immigration, through arrest, through uh, um, through employment records, etc. Um, when you're fingerprinted for anything, it gets put uploaded into IAFIS or AI A A AFIS, right? Um, and it has a, it's an entire database of fingerprints. Okay, um, so let's get into it. See who they were able to identify the person as. On an individual named uh, Carlos Rodriguez. A computer check revealed another name. Carlos Rodriguez. Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Oh, shit. 
This was forwarded to the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division. Also known as CGIS. A search of their extensive database revealed dozens of other aliases and more. Bam. Different names. Now they got the guy identified. More information on Resendez. He had an extensive record going back more than 20 years and an active warrant on a stolen vehicle charge. Oh, well, that makes sense. He stole that woman's Jeep and ran with it. But obviously much worse as well between, you know, the grape and the murder. Investigators reviewed the suspect's file from the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Which no longer exists after 2003, guys, as you guys know, after 9-11, they got rid of INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service, and the U.S. Customs Service. And they what they did was they combined the two uh, to create Immigration and Customs Enforcement, a.k.a. All, ICE. Okay, um, And then ICE, as you guys know, is broken up into two different components. There's Homeland Security Investigations, who I used to work for. Right. They have Immigration and Customs Authority and a bunch of other types of authorities that they utilize to conduct criminal investigations. Then you got um, uh, Enforcement and Removal Operations, a.k.a. ERO. They're the ones that are responsible for deport deportation of legal aliens once they're apprehended. So um, that's how they're able to get these um, INS records, because when you have when you're an illegal alien, you have something called an alien file. Uh, attached to you and that's anyone that's an, uh, an alien in the united states so even if you're like my like my parents for example they came to the united states they immigrated here they have an alien file right um anyone that immigrates to the united states whether illegal or Ill legal or illegal and wants to become a citizen to some degree they're generated an alien file is generated and they get an alien registration number versus if you get a visa you don't necessarily get an a file but if you try to go ahead and get some type of status in the united states a green card or what, whatever have you for some type of benefits and a number is going to be given to you and once the a number is given to you your a file is created so that's how they're able to identify this guy because he had to get fingerprinted when he got arrested by a border patrol or whoever whatever immigration sir uh, uh law enforcement agency picked him up because he had been deported in the past and learned resendez traveled regularly and illegally between the united states and mexico bam so that's how they got him probably border patrol had apprehended him before Most recently, he had been arrested in California for trespassing on railroad property with a loaded firearm and was deported to Mexico. Now it appeared that Rafael Resendez was back in Texas. His transient lifestyle would make him difficult to find. Detective Maha searched the suspect's records for a place to start and found the name of the fugitive's sister. She lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In a prearranged phone conference, Maha spoke with her at the Albuquerque Police Department. Yeah. I'd be able to get some things, uh, some information about your brother if that'd be all right. She wasn't able to tell me a whole lot about uh, current activity of her brother. Uh, she did not have much contact with him. She did mention that he would sometimes uh, drift through Albuquerque, stay with her for a few days, and then just uh, disappear. Detective Maha asked her to call if she heard from her brother. And I think there was a little bit of anger and resentment on her part at uh, being having to be involved with it. She really didn't want to be associated with him, if indeed he was. Uh, the, I don't blame her. He's a fucking weirdo. A real killer, as uh, as we thought that he was. Authorities also asked the public for help. They distributed wanted posters along the train routes Resendez was known to use. Dozens of tips turned up nothing. In March, three months after the doctor's murder, there was a series of reported hey. sightings in rail yards near San Antonio. Sector one, sector two, I've got that boy gone. He didn't go. I was like, "Oh shit, it's the man." He traveled. What was that? He's not even yeah, that guy, that guy was like, "Fuck that! They don't pay me enough to chase after this guy." <laughs> Two hundred miles west. Each time, he fled before police could respond. 
The suspected killer was still on the move, hopping trains and eluding authorities. With thousands of miles of train tracks to choose from, Rafael Resendez could be anywhere. Five months after the doctor's murder, and only 90 miles away in Weimar, Texas, members of a local church went to check on their pastor. He and his pastor, wife had not been at church that morning. Doors wide open. Pastor! Pastor! And just so y'all know, Weimar's in the middle of fucking nowhere. The couple was found, murdered in their own bed. It's almost mid-distance, guys, between San Antonio and Houston. So you guys can see Interstate 10, pretty much mid, mid midway. Yeah, there ain't nothing out there, though. <laughs> Weimar's a small town. Murder is nearly unheard of. Texas Rangers and the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene. And uh, yeah, in a place like this, guys, where there's it's a rural area and it's like a, a murder like that. Yeah, the Texas Rangers are going to take over. Think of the Texas Rangers as the state of Texas's FBI. They're their premier law enforcement agency. High profile murders, public corruption, um, you know, sophisticated criminal organizations. Uh, I told one of my stories about what it was like working with the Texas Rangers. I've worked with them in the past myself. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting agency. A lot of lore, a lot of uh, historical um, context with them. So, uh, yeah, it was cool. I'll tell you this, though. They wear them. The, it, everything in the movies is real. The leather boots, the the belts, um, the pants are super starch. You can stand them things in the corner and they'll stand by themselves if you wanted. Like, yeah, it's everything that you see in the movies. You know, he, uh, the, the guy that I worked with, uh, his name was Randy. Really, really nice guy. Um, he had a 1911. It was all tricked out with diamonds and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. It's It's cool how they keep up with tradition. The preacher and his wife had been bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer, a weapon of opportunity taken from their garage. The coroner set time of death at 24 to 36 hours earlier. The couple had been murdered late Friday or early Saturday morning. Money and valuables lay in plain sight. Robbery was clearly not the motive. Deputies processed the bedroom with luminol, a chemical that reacts to the protein in blood and other bodily fluids. Hey, this ain't the 70s and 80s, baby. This is the late 90s, so they got this stuff now. <laughs> Serial killers are going to be a little bit tougher for you now, man. It revealed the victim's blood and bodily fluid from an unknown source. Forensic testing later revealed the woman had been sexually assaulted. It appeared that after the murders, the killer had lingered at the crime scene. He ate in the victim's kitchen and took his time studying their driver's licenses. The Fucking weirdo, man. Stop it. Get some help. Investigators at the scene were unaware of the West University Place murder, but not for long. Yeah, guys, keep in mind that at this point, right, they're like, what the hell's going on here? They're, you know, about an hour, 100 miles away from Houston. So um, Maha, that detective over there in, in the West University Place, he's conducting his own investigation. And this is kind of the toughness sometimes with dealing with serial killers, because serial killers, guys, are typically state investigations right because it's it's murder premeditated murder at that so the feds don't get involved with that so when it's a state it's you know the local police department maybe the sheriff's office that handles it and unless they do some kind of outreach a lot of times you're not going to know about other open murder investigations in the area unless you guys are you know meeting with each other and talking with each other granted now in the late 90s there's some computers you know there's databases that you know law enforcement can use or whatever but um you know this is a little bit better than back 20 years prior when we're covering people like you know obviously john wayne gacy and um, Ted Bundy, etc. This was a big problem for a lot of the law enforcement agencies. The Night Stalker, even in this, case, you know. So, um, so yeah, this is a little bit different. Let's get back to the doc. 
In May 1999, Texas authorities were on the trail of a fugitive, Rafael Resendez. Fingerprints implicated him in the murder of a doctor in West University Place. Four months later, a preacher and his wife were found beaten to death in their home in Weimar. The couple's red pickup truck was missing, probably stolen by the killer. Police put out an APB for the vehicle. At the Department of Public Safety, investigators from the Texas Rangers were troubled by the crime scene. The evidence in the house, partially eaten food and displayed ID cards, suggested a ritualistic killer. The Rangers contacted the FBI's Houston field office to get the opinion of a criminal profiler, Special Agent Mark Young. You have in a crime scene a lot of messages, a lot of forensic uh, evidence, and a lot of behavior. And profilers, guys, can be helpful where they're able to kind of give you a pattern and give you predictions on where he may strike next, what type of background he's from, race, education level, etc. So that helps investigators with getting uh, a profile, essentially, on who the hell this individual is so that they can go ahead and start to narrow down suspects. Behavioral evidence. You can pick up not only the forensics, the fingerprints, the DNA, the hairs and fibers, and those types of things, but you can also get a, a look into the offender's behavior. The way he commits that crime is unique. It's different than any other offender. Young noted that this killer acted with extreme rage, but no sign of panic. What really struck me behaviorally was this offender uh, unlike a lot of others, spent an incredible amount of time in that house going through everything. Their wallet and, and purse, respectively, were opened up and their identification was showing. In other words, the offender sat there and looked at their photographs, did not taking any credit cards, not taking any cash. Profilers can analyze a killer's behavioral choices in an attempt to reveal details about him. In this case, after killing the victims, the perpetrator kept striking with his weapon. But then he covered their bodies. This suggested perhaps even he was repelled by the results of his actions. Displaying the victim. Yeah, very strange. His ID cards might be an act of domination, as if he wanted details about the lives he had taken. One of the Texas Rangers Young spoke to had seen something like this before. He realized, because he had some knowledge of the case in West University, that some of the same types of things had happened. And he said, hey, guys, uh, you know, could this be connected? Not only are we looking at some M.O. that, that seems similar, but we're looking at behavior, uh, this uh, ritualistic behavior, or what we call sometimes signature uh, of an offender. If there was a connection between the two cases, the forensics lab would find it. One of the advantages we had is that we had forensic evidence in both places. We had uh, fingerprints and DNA evidence. Which is a convenience of the late 90s uh, that they had this, man. Obviously, as you guys know from covering these other serial killers that were operating in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, they didn't have DNA and forensic evidence to their advantage to be able to convict these guys. So, um, hell, I mean, they were to convict Richard Ramirez, who I covered earlier today, on a murder and rape of a nine-year-old child um, in 2009 that occurred back in 1984 because they found his DNA at, at the location. They were going to match it up. So this is the power of DNA and forensics. In the West University case, we also had DNA evidence at uh, the Weimar location. DNA analysis revealed that the bodily fluid recovered in both cases matched. The same man sexually assaulted both women. Since the first victim's Jeep had been recovered, investigators wondered how the killer got to the second crime scene. In both cases, a vehicle had been stolen after the crime. That would have meant uh, traditionally that uh, somebody had to bring the person there or that they were somebody from close by. 
Young studied the case file of suspect Rafael Resendez. There was information already in that fugitive investigation indicating that Resendez got around by train. According to the file, there were train tracks 50 yards from the doctor's house in West University Place. We turned around and looked. There's a train track immediately across the street from the Weimar location. With the two cases directly connected, investigators believed Rafael Resendez was a ritual serial killer. And the manner that he did these crimes is somewhat evolutionary. Uh, you don't just wake up one day and, and boom, get involved in that type of crime. It's something that you've uh, practiced, you've built up to, uh, and you've done before. And he's not going to stop uh, all of a sudden either. They feared Resendez was using stolen vehicles and the railroads to find his next victim. So this obviously presents a problem because it's much harder to track him if he's using the railroad system, right, which is not for people, but human use, and stealing cars. The guy's invisible. And then on top of that, he's an illegal alien. He's not even supposed to be in the United States. So he has almost no markers of identity. Fortunately, they know who the hell he is, but finding him is another issue. At the Houston field office, the FBI's fugitive squad joined the hunt for Resendez. Special Agent Bobby Eckert led the investigation. We knew that he had fled the jurisdiction and had most likely traveled interstate and, in fact, into Mexico. Because Resendez had likely left Texas, they obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. Oh, bam. So as you guys can see right here, uh, you know, District of um, Southern District of Texas, which is a district that I used to be in when I was an agent myself, um, and they got a warrant for him. You know what? Matter of fact, let's put this thing into Pacer real fast. So you okay. Can, you can look it up, right? Yeah, you can. we can look it up. So hold on. So I'm going to go ahead. Western, uh, Western District. I'll show you guys how to do this. So you're going to go Pacer, Southern District them. of Texas. You hear me? What was that? You're not showing them. No, I know. Oh, thank you very much. I, I had to pull it up on the side. So here we go. Here it is, guys. Right. Uh, you know what? We're going to go. Oh, actually, you know what? No, no, no. We're good here. Log in. All right. We're going to query. Ah, oh, damn it. I don't remember. You know what? Hold on. Maybe I can do it on Google Chrome. Give me one second, guys. I'll pull this up right now. I'll take a quick screenshot of this. And then I'll pull it up for you guys on the side and keep playing. Because Resendis had likely left Texas, they obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. And this is also known as a um, UFAP warrant, guys. So if the state right, is able to, and this is very common, if the state's able to indict someone and or charge them for some kind of felony crime and they, they flee, the feds, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll go to the FBI, they'll go to Homeland Security, whatever it may be, and they'll be like, hey, listen, we need you guys, we need federal resources, we need help finding this guy. He might have fled the country, sorry, he might have fled the state, and with someone that's using the railroad system, obviously that affects interstate commerce significantly, so that would be a smart move to go ahead and get an unlawful flight or prosecution warrant, and that allows the state to utilize you know, the resource of the federal government to track this guy down. Um, so here it is. Right here, I was able to screenshot it. So I got the case number here, guys. I'll pull it up for y'all here, but we'll keep playing the doc. The doc. Seven, it would allow the FBI to add its federal resources to the hunt. The first thing that we wanted to do is to find out everything that we possibly could about Resendez. We knew that he had been arrested over 13 times. I immediately started getting all the prison record pin packets so that I could identify not only relatives, but associates, determine his patterns, all the interviews revealed to us that this was a man who was not well known by anybody. His family had not really had a lot of contact with him since he left home at 12 years of age and moved to Acapulco and eventually to Florida. With little to go on, criminal profiler Mark Young tried to unlock the drifter's past to predict his next move. He forwarded details of both cases to analysts at the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. 
VICAP analysts use sophisticated databases to identify similar unsolved cases. Immediately, uh, they were able to return to me a case. So here it is, guys. I was able to find it. This is the off the case number that they that they gave. Okay. Um, right here. You put, if I pull it up, this is the Southern District of uh, Texas. Run the query, Docker report, because that was off the case number. And bam, as you guys can see, a complaint was filed on uh, May twenty seventh, nineteen ninety nine. Oh, Warrant was issued it. same day, um, and they went and got him later on, uh, which you guys will see when they executed it. But let's let's keep going. In Lexington, Kentucky, a Hispanic male had assaulted uh, a college student uh, and murdered uh, her boyfriend. Bam. So through, you know, using these databases, guys, they're able to link um, the killer to another crime all the way in Kentucky. Wild, right? They didn't they didn't have this type of access back in the 70s and 80s. This happened uh, late at night in 1997 near the railroad tracks where these two had been walking. The male was killed by his skull being crushed by a rock, and the female was sexually assaulted. She was also physically assaulted, pretty severe injuries. Though dazed by the attack, the young woman somehow survived. Seeing that her boyfriend was dead, she made her way to a nearby house where residents called the police. She was able to give them an artist depiction, uh, to a local artist, of uh, the offender. Young received the Holy! <laughs> Yo! That chick described it fucking perfectly. Look at that. That wow. sketch artist and that chick? Fucking crazy. That accuracy is wild. Sketch from the Lexington Police Department. I compared it, and I didn't immediately say, wow, you know, this is him. What I felt was kind of a guarded optimism that this could be the same guy. But a sketch. Guarded optimism, bro. That's him. What are you talking about, man? Bumbaka! Sketch isn't proof. Young needed scientific evidence to be sure. He learned that the Lexington police still had DNA samples from the sexual assault two years earlier and arranged for the samples to be flown to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. At the DNA analysis unit, examiners began processing the samples. A uh, couple samples to be worked. Examiner uh, Alan Giusti. Out of Kentucky. We looked at 13 different unique DNA regions, and we developed an individual profile at each one of those regions. I describe it like looking at a person's physical characteristics. You can look at one DNA region, and it might be the same as another person's. And that'd be like saying that two people both have brown eyes. Well, that's very common. You look at 13 different DNA regions, it's like saying somebody has brown eyes, is left-handed, is six foot three, is got red hair. The more DNA regions you look at, the more complete the picture you get of the person. Bam. So that was a really simple way of explaining how, you know, DNA analysis in a very crude manner works. After mapping the DNA profile of the perpetrator from Lexington, Juicy contacted the examiners in Texas who had mapped the samples from Weimar and West University Place. By comparing the results uh, that I obtained with the results they obtained, uh, we were both able to determine that we had a possible common donor. In other words, the same person was committing these crimes. In Texas, Young forwarded the news Man. to the other investigators. I was able to call Lexington PD, and I heard a lot of hooping and hollering because they thought it was going to be an unsolved case. Yeah, they're like, woo, we got that boy. Woo, yeah. We know who the fuck this motherfucker is. This Mexican. We going to get him. Woo. America. Yeah. <laughs> they were probably Seriously? going crazy over there in Lexington, man. <laughs> they are going found. wild because, yo, they didn't know who the fuck it was. They are like, what the hell? So, yeah, man, now now the case, they're, they're, for them, they're like, we know who it is.
They were probably going wild. And that's the power of bringing the feds into your investigation sometimes, guys. That VICAP, right, that federal law enforcement database, they're able to utilize that thing and link it to another crime and contact that PD, get DNA samples from them, and then, bam, they marry up the two Texas investigations, right, Waymore, Waymore, Texas, and West University Place, and, bam, they're able to connect, connect it with Lexington, Kentucky. Boom. Now they got him identified at three different crime scenes with three different victims. <laughs> them dudes went wild. Woo! Yeah! What? America. That's it. Lexington police. Yeah, I know it's a pretty good southern accent, isn't it? It's so bad. Fuck you. <laughs> police now had Rafael Resendez as their prime suspect. <laughs> Authorities across the southwest canvassed homeless shelters and train yards. They knew Resendez was out there somewhere. On May 28th, Authorities found the preacher's truck abandoned near a train yard in San Antonio. Ah, the preacher's truck from Waymer, Texas, guys. Which, again, Waymer is about one hour west of San Antonio, guys. All right, here, I'll show you guys real quick. So what does he do again? He abandons the truck in the same goddamn city as he did with the doctor, San Antonio. Which San Antonio, by the way, guys, has a huge Mexican population. Very strong. Um. Hispanic community there, which would make sense why he would go there because a lot of people, this guy more than likely probably didn't speak English. So him being in San Antonio is able to blend in. People speak Spanish. He's able to operate a little bit more freely. He's around his people. So, and there's, there's a big illegal population in San Antonio as well. It looks like Huge smuggling location. What was that? It looks like your car. My car? <laughs> yeah, okay. Mine's a Honda, okay? Don't insult me like that. <laughs> It looked like Resendez had returned to the rails. Finding him would be an overwhelming task for Special Agent Eckert and her team. We had never faced this type of obstacle before. There are thousands of tracks, there are thousands of trains every day. And it was difficult to determine which line that he rode. With a massive search area to cover, they had to be resourceful. One way we handled this is we developed a small wanted poster that we gave to the people that frequently rode the railroads. In train yards across the nation, locals were advised to be on the lookout for Rafael Resendez. If they spotted him, they should call the FBI fugitive squad immediately. When we received these calls, we would contact the railroad police. They would pull the person off the train and identify them. Agents and railroad police responded to hundreds of sightings. Each time, it wasn't rescinded. The FBI's best lead was the fugitive sister in New Mexico. Agents stayed in contact with her, hoping she might hear from him. And if she did hear from him, they hoped she'd talk. So far, it seemed the only way to track Resendez was to follow a trail of bodies. On June 4th, 1999, a Fayette County, Texas woman stopped by her mother's house to check on her. The 73-year-old widow lived alone. The house had been ransacked. Imagine the horror. You come to your, you know, your parents' place. Place is all fucked up. You haven't heard from them? Man. There was no sign of her mother. Mom! As she searched each room, her panic rose. Mother! Then, in the bedroom, she found her mother's body. The elderly woman had been bludgeoned to death. In 1999, Agents were on the trail of Rafael Resendez, linked to four murders in Texas and Kentucky. As his notoriety grew, 
the press dubbed him the Railroad Killer. Now, an elderly widow had been murdered in rural Fayette County, Texas. Like the other victims, she lived near a railroad. The gruesome crime looked like the work of Rafael Resendez, according to FBI Special Agent Mark Young. When you looked at that real brutal style of murder, you felt like, yeah, I'm okay, be dealing with the same guy because she was covered similarly. There were uh, jewelry boxes that had been opened up in other rooms. Things had been opened and gone through, and there were items taken. It was a familiar and disturbing pattern. Cash and jewelry had been left behind. Fayetteville, guys, isn't that far from Waymer, as you guys can see. It's uh, right here, rural Texas. And just so y'all know, in between major cities, right, like San Antonio and Houston, all these sm small little towns in between, man, there ain't nothing out here, guys. We're talking about farmland, small towns with maybe like a thousand people. Like, bro, Texas is different for you city slickers out there. All right. I lived in South Texas, so I'm very familiar with uh, how rural Texas can be. Instead, the killer stole trinkets and personal items as if taking souvenirs. Fingerprints in the laundry room indicated the killer had broken in through a rear window. The print was later similar to the Night Stalker matched to Resendez. This dude didn't give a fuck either. He knew that the police were looking for him. He was just leaving fingerprints all over the place. Sloppy, sloppy work. Very stupid. After slaying his victim, he was in no rush to leave. Not only did he go around to all of the rooms, take certain items, and spend an inordinate amount of time, uh, he went and had some fruit and uh, some bread which was a thing that we had seen a, a number of times. I take that to be more of a... My man was hungry. Like, what the hell? Signature showing that I totally own and dominate this individual and their belongings more than a, I'm hungry and I need something to eat. Two distinctive clues at the Fayette County scene seemed intended as a message to investigators. The newspaper had been placed on the sofa open to an article about the recovery of the preacher's stolen vehicle. In a guest bedroom, they found a toy train. It had been recently unpacked and set up on the bed. Yep, now does he now? <laughs> he was looking at the police trying to antagonize him now. You know, got the article open to himself. He's clearly following himself on the news. And that's what happens a lot of these serial killers, man. A lot of serial killers end up being fucking clout chasers. They really enjoy seeing themselves on the news. People don't know who they are. Or in this case, they know exactly who the fuck he is. And he's just like, oh, yeah, catch me if you can. It seemed the railroad killer was taunting the authorities. The canine unit followed his scent to the train tracks. From there, the trail went cold. Less than 24 hours later, the next victim was discovered. Another gruesome murder near railroad tracks. This one 95 miles from Fayette County. I got a call in regard to a crime scene in Houston that was being assessed by the Houston Police Department. Uh, they were noticing some similarities. A 26-year-old school teacher was found sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death in her bedroom. Her driver's license had been removed from her wallet and displayed on a table. Same MO, leaving them driver's licenses out. Like the other victims, she lived near railroad tracks. The teacher's car, a white Honda sedan, had been stolen. Later DNA analysis confirmed Resendez had assaulted the woman. Now he was killing at a much faster pace. And this is fairly common when uh, they know that the police are on them. They just go on a killing spree a lot of times, guys. You know, people will think, oh, are they going to chill or whatever? No, sometimes it actually speeds them up 
because uh, they see that the doors are closing in on them, or the sorry, the walls are closing in on them. One of the concerns we did have was that this guy was going to evolve into what we call a spree killer. Uh, a lot of times in the past, we've had serial killers, uh, Ted Bundy, uh, for instance, uh, that the pressure got so great uh, that they went into a spree mode, and that is they began to kill a number of victims with really no cooling off period. With his last two victims killed in a 24-hour period, it appeared Resendez had made the shift to spree killer. 2014, three-step protection on the conductor. Step in there, air and brake, go out. On June 6th, a rail yard worker spotted the fugitive in Flatonia, Texas, halfway between Houston and San Antonio. Immediately notified local police in the that voice is hilarious. FBI. Once again, Resendez slipped away. Okay, guys, we've got some additional information. At the Houston FBI field office, Operation Train Stop was created. Now, investigators from more than 30 agencies were assigned exclusively to the case. Oh, shit. Now they're going now they're going hard, a.k.a. You triggered my trap card. Them task forces don't fuck around, man. You remember we got Special Agent Bobby Eckerd was part of the operation that was comprised of two basic squads. You had the one squad that was the serial homicide investigators that were looking into the various homicides, developing evidence. And if you guys remember, I broke I broke down how the FBI is broken up. But essentially, a squad is a group of five to ten agents that have a supervisor over them. And they're tasked with working together in a group. And they typically investigate some type of crime in unison. <laughs> of crimes then the other side was the fugitive investigators that their sole purpose was to locate apprehend and arrest rescinded the fugitive squad looked for patterns in the suspect's past we were able to determine that he followed the crops um, throughout the united states in washington state he followed the avocado route in florida he would be involved in the citrus crops in kentucky and north carolina he would pick tobacco Bam. So there we go. They're, now they got a pattern of his travel that is dependent upon the crop season so that he can find work as a migrant worker. And that is stereotypical as hell. Stupid. <laughs> but yeah, basically an illegal Mexican running around the United States based off of crop seasons and also being a serial killer at the same time. This guy, quite frankly, you stupid. After identifying farm work sites and addresses of friends and family, agents would try to eliminate these comfort zones. You go everywhere that you can possibly think of that the fugitive might show up. By going there, by law enforcement presence in those places, people aren't willing to help out the fugitive anymore. But this fugitive was com Good strategy. comfortable traveling fast and on his own without any help. And his murder spree was not yet over. Eight days after the school teacher was killed in Houston, her car was found 300 miles away near the Mexican border. Inside was a knife, but no sign of where Resendez had gone. All right, Del Rio, Texas, man. I've been there before. <laughs> Did a Lank King case out of there with another agent. Um, here, Del Rio, guys, on the Mexican board. I'm going to show you guys this real fast. Oh, hold on. My bad. Where are we at? Oh, hold on. So, Del Rio, guys. Okay, and she was killed in Houston. So just so you guys get an idea of the distance he traveled. That is a five-hour drive, pretty much the other side of the state. 
okay? And Del Rio is um, across from Acuna, Ciudad Acuna. Brings back good memories. Living in Texas. In 1999, more than 30 law enforcement agencies hunt. Nearby were train tracks, giving the killer a clean escape to almost anywhere. In 1999, more than 30 law enforcement agencies hunted for Rafael Resendez, known as the Railroad Killer. Whenever a new crime appeared to be the work of the killer, Special Agent Mark Young investigated. I was getting hundreds of calls from departments around the country wanting me to uh, listen to their stories about their crimes and, and determine whether uh, the cases might be linked. On June 15th, the bodies of a 51-year-old woman and her father were discovered in their home in rural Gorham, Illinois. The local sheriff's office believed Resendez was involved and called Mark Young. As soon as we walked onto the scene, we could have been... So this is great interagency cooperation. You know, at this point now, they know the FBI is involved. They're looking for this guy. Hey, we think it's this asshole. This was the power of technology and working together uh, where they're able to quickly, you know, notify the FBI and get them involved in the investigation early on and link another murder to this subject. In one of our crime scenes in Texas, the double rail tracks were right behind uh, the older man's residence. The killer broke in through a back window. He used a weapon of opportunity, a shotgun he found in the home. He stole a few trinkets and ate the victim's food. Yeah, sure. But this time, the killer had added something new, a statement scrawled on the wall. A lot of people thought, oh, God, we got some other type of offender here uh, that's making a political statement. Pseudo-intellectual type. But Young knew better. He had reviewed the fugitive's prison file, including his correspondence. And he fantasizes that he's He had been writing political messages and letters that we were able to view in the past. That was even further indication to me that this is the same offender because this now is the rest of his fantasy coming out. In his own mind, Resendez was a deep political thinker. No more Serbians killed by your sons. What the? Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but thankfully, you know, the FBI did their profile. They knew better. Hey, bro, you're not going to throw us off the trail. We know who the hell you are. But authorities knew he was a vicious predator. He was tied up in his chair. She was straight across the office. They believed he got to Gorham on the train and left in the victim's car, which was recovered the next day, 60 miles south near the Kentucky border. Police across the country checked cold cases looking for murders Resendez might have committed. And it was Special Agent Young investigated one in Hughes Springs, Texas. In October of 1998, a woman had been beaten to death with an antique flat iron. Though unsolved, the murder had been thoroughly investigated and documented. And I felt like there was a good possibility that Resendez was responsible for that case, too. Because as you guys know, Resendez, what does he do? He's an opportunistic uh, killer when it comes to using weapons. So he finds things in the house and just beats the crap out of the person with them, right? So this obviously could also be him, another rural part of Texas. Didn't you tell me? We had blunt force trauma. Uh, she was an elderly victim. She was not uh, sexually assaulted, but she was covered in a similar fashion. And in looking at his crime scene photography, I see where uh, her identification had been placed up as if the offender looked at it. Bam, with a half-eaten apple as well. 
pretty much effectively linked. Because it happened at home. Because the spree killer could be anywhere, the FBI placed Rafael Resendez on their 10 most wanted fugitives list. Oh, Lord, you make it on the top 10 most fugitive wanted list, bro? FBI, open up! They're coming for you, man. They're fucking coming for you. And a big reason why, guys, they push to put people on the top 10 want most wanted list is it allows them to divert more resources to said subjects and also put up higher awards, etc. So, yo... <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to put on the top 10 most wanted list, you're probably going to get found. So that's an L for your boy, Resendez. Or in this case, I'm going to call, call him Lesendez. <laughs> His mug shots were posted with 30 different aliases. Hold on. Let me just remove. Add it back. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd hoped it might shake new leads free. What this does is it raises the awareness of the case, the fugitive status, and it also allowed for us to offer up to $50,000 for the successful apprehension of Resendez. News of the Resendez case swept through the country. On heightened alert, agents and police searched hundreds of freight trains and train yards. It was as if Resendez had disappeared. A violation. Don Clark, then special agent in charge of the Houston field office, held press conferences to help spread the word. Oh, man. Yeah, they're on, they're on his ass now, man. Operation Train Stop. FBI holding a press conference for this guy with the news all there. Yep. But he was candid about the case's difficulty. Uh, to you. It's a very complex investigation. It's one like many of us have never been involved with before. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of unknowns here. We're dealing with a lot of pieces of information, and it's a very difficult investigation for all of the agencies. The story led news broadcasts nationwide. And with eight victims now dead, the public was terrified. Eight is more than enough, many more than enough. One is more than enough. And that's all that I can assure the public is that law enforcement is working together to try and get this person out of the street. The fugitive was deceptively smart and incredibly dangerous. He could move across the country easily and slip across the border at will. What we were trying to let people know was this is not some railroad hobo or bum uh, that doesn't have any sense traveling around. This is a guy with a good IQ uh, that knew how to evade law enforcement, uh, that we needed a lot of assistance in capturing. This is a guy that was attacking innocent people in their sleep, and there was nobody really safe. The reward for the fugitive's capture climbed to $125,000. Oh, Lee, $125,000. That's quite a bit for the government. You know, they're cheapskates. <laughs> Here, and I'm going to go ahead and you know me and my inflation calculator. I'm going to figure this out. Calls came in from all over the country. I'd like to. In late June, Resendez was spotted at a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky. But he never stayed in one place for long. Before the police could arrive, he was gone. Sergeant Mark Barnard of the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department warned the public. Uh, so just so you guys know, $125,000 in 1999 is worth $223,598.44 today. So pretty much damn near doubled. Uh, if I lived near a railroad track, I'd certainly have it well lit. Uh, I'd check and make sure nothing is uh, out of the ordinary. I'd know my environment, my neighbors. I'd check my doors and windows. The tips kept coming. We had 3,178 calls that came into the command post. From those calls, we generated over 1,100 leads. In other words, things that needed to be done throughout the United States and in Mexico. And the fact that they had a command post, guys, tells me how serious they had they, they made this case. A command post basically is where all the leads come into one central location, and then from there, they take the leads, vet them out, okay, is this a fucking prank caller, this some bullshit, whatever it may be, and then 
if it is a good lead, they delegate it out to an agent, to a task force officer, to anyone that's in where to a detective, whoever's working on the investigation alongside the FBI, which in this case, it was a bunch of state agencies, right? Even other, st other um, states as well, like in Kentucky, they would hand out those leads. They'd go out, they'd interview a subject here. They'd look at a license plate here. They do surveillance on this location here. They'd go uh, do a record check over here. So all these leads are being followed up on. And they're coming to one central location that allows all the flow of information to pass through smoothly and be disseminated amongst the different agencies and partners. And they do this a lot of the times with inve terrorism investigations. I'll never forget when the when the uh, Boston Marathon bombing happened, they did the same exact thing with a command post. And I go into detail about this on the Boston Marathon bombing episode, which I did a whole breakdown on that as well. Go check that one out, guys. We cover all types of crime over, crimes over here on Feta, baby. So, guys, like the goddamn video, all right? Because ain't nobody else breaking down stuff like this on the Internet. One credible tip was phoned into the Denver field office. The caller reported seeing Resendez at a house in Commerce City, Colorado. After authorities traced a phone call from the house to the Mexico town where Resendez had family, a tactical arrest team responded. Yeah! and moved in for the capture. Seven months into the search for Rafael Resendez, an arrest team raided a house in Commerce City, Colorado. They secured the occupants and searched the house. But Resendez was nowhere to be found. And authorities later determined the tip was a case of mistaken identity. Texas Rangers and the FBI agents kept in contact with a fugitive sister in New Mexico. She assured them that she had not heard from her brother, but promised that if he called, she would contact them. But at the FBI command post in Houston, the next big lead concerned a relative no one knew about before. Agents learned Resendez had a wife in Mexico. Special Agent Bobby Eckert followed up on the surprising new lead. The command post became aware that he had a common law wife because she was interviewed by Mexican media. And a local station got a copy of that interview and showed it, aired it locally. At that point, we brought his wife to Houston for a two-day interview. Authorities needed to know as much as they could about Resendez, his patterns, and the places he had stayed. And did he write you all the time? She provided us with a lot of information about Resendez and his habits over the last two or three years. She advised that he brought her jewelry. He brought her figurines, sometimes little angel figurines. He brought her, up. her a guitar. I knew that a lot of these items had been stolen from crime scenes. And it in fact turned out that these items were linked to the homicides. She said Resendez had been in Mexico very recently, but she hadn't seen him in days. She was cooperating because she feared he wasn't safe there. In Mexico, bounty hunters were after him. Resendez was running out of places to hide. Yeah, they had a big ass fucking award on his ass. On July 10th, 1999, investigators received a phone page from Albuquerque. It was the fugitive's sister. Yes, I'm returning your call. She needed to talk to authorities. Okay, we're on our way. According to Special Agent Mark Young. There were relatives in Mexico uh, that were being approached by law enforcement, by uh, bounty hunters, by curiosity seekers. It's the best thank you for the page. Um, can you tell there were that people that really on? didn't care how they got him across. You know, dead or alive, I want the reward money. She said her brother had called her. She did not want him to be harmed. Law enforcement told her that uh, we could effect a safe surrender for him and we would agree to treat him humanely uh, and get him in custody uh, to resolve this thing. 
On July 12, 1999, Rafael Resendez agreed to turn himself in to a Texas Ranger at a small border crossing. Hands on the bed. Respecting his sister's wishes, authorities agreed to let him walk across and to take him in with a minimal arrest team. One of the most vicious serial killers in the nation's history. I've done surrenders like this at the at the border. It's it's crazy. It's a very unique situation um, because you know I hate to say it, but the criminal has leverage. Like that, you gotta you gotta get them to come to you. And a lot of the times, you know, they want it. They don't want it to be a big spectacle with news people there and everything. So you got to do it nice and you know surreptitiously, and you know maintain the person's dignity. And at the end of the day, guys, you're not there to take away the guy's dignity. You're there to take away his freedom. And those are two very distinct, different things. And if they're respectful. Why not, right? Better get him in custody than, you know, no, nah, we're going to make this a big old scene and stuff like that, nah, man. The, the, the families need justice. You got to put your pride away sometimes. Was taken into custody quietly and without incident. In follow-up interviews with Mark Young, Resendez would confess to a total of 13 murders, four of them not yet connected to him by authorities. He could recall in incredible detail <coughs> crimes that occurred several years before after discussions with him i would contact the uh, jurisdictions that had primary uh control of the investigations that that he was referring to and we uh resolved two homicides in florida marion county florida uh one in colton california uh and uh uh, one homicide in Barrow County, uh, Georgia. You tell me the train. The question in everyone's mind was why. In the interviews, Resendez made the sickening claim that he killed to wipe out evil. Yet among his victims were a typical coping strategy from a lot of these killers. The nice stalker, same thing. Oh, I worship the devil. Doctor, a preacher, and his wife a teacher and elderly people Did you murder? all upstanding citizens well loved by their families the search for rafael resendez took eight months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in court he attempted to use an insanity defense to explain his crimes but in may of 2000 he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Four days later, Rafael Resendez was sentenced to death. Yep, good riddance, man. You don't deserve to die. So here he is right here, guys. Okay, um, Angel Materno Resendez, born August 1st, 1960, died June 26, 27, 2006, also known as the Rogo Killer, was a Mexican uh, in, in a rent serial killer, suspected... Inerrant. Yeah, I think that I pronounced that right. Uh, suspected in as many as 23 murders across the United States and Mexico during the 1990s. Some also involved sexual assault. He had become known as a railroad killer as most of his crimes were committed near railroads where he had jumped off the trains, which he was using to travel around the country. On June 21st, 1999, he briefly became the 457th fugitive listed by the FBI on his 10 most wanted fugitive list before surrendering to the Texas authorities. On July 13, 1999, he was convicted of capital murder in Texas and executed by lethal injection in 2006. So, um, yeah, guys, uh, crazy story. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Texas doesn't fuck around. I think Texas, if I'm not mistaken, has the most executions of any state in the United States. Uh, Christina, what are your final thoughts on this? I told you it was just like the other case. It was very similar, yes. Because of like the... He was eating, breaking into houses, up, eating their food. food. Yeah, yeah, like, very mean, similar to to the the night stalker. They honestly didn't care about getting caught because they clearly was like, "I'm gonna leave all my DNA everywhere." So. <laughs> yeah, both of them. <laughs> the only difference is, is at least with fucking Richard Ramirez, the night stalker, he did this shit in the '80s before, like they actually formally had uh, DNA solving cases. I don't think the first crime was solved by DNA until you know 1987. This fucking idiot didn't give a shit. He was like, "Ah, oh, fingerprints, but DNA. I'll just leave it, like, it around. Who cares?" And another country like. We don't really, we're not updated how the United States Yeah. Are. So yeah. He, he, his mind is like, he's oh, thinking like Mexican authorities, me. right? Yeah. He probably was doing all kinds of crazy shit in Mexico. 
You know, I, I guarantee he wasn't just committing these kinds of crimes here in the States. He was probably doing this in Mexico as well. And they probably had, you know, far less sophisticated investigative techniques than in the U.S. They're all so, crazy. Yeah. But uh, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed that episode, man. Go ahead and don't forget to like the video. Subscribe to the channel. I'll catch you guys in another episode of Fed It. We break down more uh, cases of different types of crooks. And uh, love you guys. Peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what FedEx covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendant is 6'9. Uh, and then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, 6'9 ran with. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA Bushite, he's violated.